and welcome to our fifth lecture on attention in this uh, ongoing online summer series in cognition. Uh, we'll be talking today about divided attention and task switching, and there is some question about whether or not people genuinely divide their attention or if they're generally task switching. Um, but we'll present a couple of uh, views of divided attention uh, and talk about why this is particularly important. Um, in uh, certainly in a modern context because there are a lot of uh, things competing for our attention and it's an important question to think about. So we'll start off by talking about capacity theories of dividing attention. Basic idea behind these theories is you can divide your attention so long as you never exceed uh, available resources. So there's a finite capacity and if you exceed that, then something's going to suffer. The structural limits view of, of divided attention has to do with what you are trying to divide your attention between. So if they are highly related, so reading and listening to a lecture at the same time, so trying to take lecture notes while trying to read something else, like your text messages or your Facebook, um, are particularly difficult. Uh, we'll talk then about uh, task switching and a ta a switch costs, which is important. And then we'll finish up with some applications of divided attention. In particular, we'll talk about uh, distracted driving and distracted walking as two important areas of, uh, of concern. So let's start with uh, capacity theories of dividing attention. The aim is to explain how we can perform or appear to perform more than one task at a time. And we refer to this as dual task performance. So, um, you know, walking and chewing gum, walking and talking, um, these are things that most people can do fairly well. Um, we'll see in a bit that walking and using, uh, trying to text message is actually not something you do well. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that here in a bit. The general view here is that we have a general limited pool of resources, that the amount of cognitive resources required by a task uh, just depends on how complex the task is. So the first view is we have limited resources. Once that pool has been depleted, uh, then things will start to suffer. So we'll have to task switch, or we'll pay less attention to one thing, um, et cetera. And the amount of cognitive resources required really depends on how complex the task is. And we all have a basic idea of this phenomenon, that the more difficult something is, the more attention it requires, the more we have to focus on that thing alone. Um, and so we can really easily see how um, there isn't much in terms of our cognitive resources. And we start to see also over time as we get older, um, our ability to ignore irrelevant stimuli um, and focus on one thing, um, and our ability to try to focus on more than one thing at a time, if that's even possible, gets really more difficult. I'm really of the view that, that we don't generally divide our attention. What we do is switch back and forth rapidly. Um, and as a result, we're never as good at doing two things as we are at one. Uh, but the idea here is the more complex something is, the more resources it takes up. So then we have to allocate resources. So when the pool of resources is in insufficient, we have to allocate. Um, and so some tasks may suffer or we have to switch back and forth. Um, and these are important considerations because you probably don't want your driving performance to suffer because you're paying attention to Facebook or checking a text message or even just thinking about uh, something important going on in your life that you think you need to deal with. Uh, these are um, issues that we need to think about. And so we'll talk more about that as well when we talk about mind wandering a little later on today. So uh, one of the things that um, we do talk about with allocation policies is sort of are there ways in which we allocate our attentional resources once we have exceeded that capacity. One of these things we call enduring dispositions, and these are built-in stimuli that will always capture our attention. We talked earlier in previous lectures about our name. Our name is one of those things that we will always pay attention to. It will automatically capture our attention, which is why when you say somebody's name, they will automatically direct their attention towards you. So my suggestion, if you're planning to gossip about them, is to not use their name. Um, this is some important things to realize uh, that using someone's name will automatically direct their attention towards you. So keep that in mind. It's a better way to save friendships. Other enduring dispositions include things like um, movement. We've talked about this. That's the reason why uh, signs and whatnot are designed to capture our attention by moving quite a bit 
particularly anything moving very rapidly in our peripheral vision, will automatically capture our attention because that's a potential threat. Other things we are kind of built to pay attention to are crying infants. Um, we really can't ignore a crying infant, which is why it's so um, upsetting to us. That's why crying babies are bother us so much uh, if we're on an airplane, for example, because you can't ignore it. You're basically built in to pay attention to that. And this is a basic survival of the species mechanism. Um, so those are enduring dispositions. Momentary intentions are situational dispositions to allocate resources depending on the situation. So if you're um, sitting with a bunch of friends at dinner, you can you know, listen to one conversation or another. You know, if you're having a conversation or you're trying to listen in on one people's conversation to try to jump in um, or uh, see what they're having to say, those are momentary intentions. So your attention can um, switch from one to the other. And you do this in class and whatnot all the time. Your attention focuses on the instructor and then it might drift off for a minute or you take some notes or text your friends or get on Facebook. These are all things you shouldn't be doing during class, but these are things that we do realize happen. So some predictions of capacity theories are that we can attend to more than one thing so long as our resources are not exceeded. Um, that's a prediction of capacity theory. Um, performance on one task will decline if the resource pool is exceeded. <coughs> Pardon me. And the system is flexible. Um, so we can um, shift our attention, divide our attention, move it away this way or that way based on what our current needs are. One thing we do know is that automaticity is key, that well-practiced tasks require fewer resources. So um, this is the reason why walking um, can go along with other things like talking, um, but you'll never walk as fast when you're talking to somebody as you do when you're just by yourself. Uh, and you certainly won't walk as fast if you're on the phone or if you're trying to text message, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. Uh, but those well-practiced tasks tend to require fewer resources. So that then gets us to structural limits uh, ideas about divided attention. And here it's attentional tasks that interfere with each other uh, are the problem. So they interfere with each other to the extent they involve similar activities. So trying to read and listen to somebody speak at the same time. Um, in particular, we also find that tasks that share one sensory modality may have higher interference. So trying to listen to two different people talking at the same time. Um, etc. or if they involve the same kind of processes, so language. And uh, it gets really much more difficult uh, the more in common uh, cognitive tasks might have. So it's something really uh, to think about in particular uh, when we start talking about mind wandering in a moment. Um, but there are also of course people that believe that our attention actually isn't divided rather there were task switching particularly things that are particularly close to one another in their um, requirements so we often see people switching back and forth from listening to writing to reading uh, etc and the problem with task switching is there are um, difficulties with ta task switching so when we direct our attention to a particular task we develop a mental set that is, it facilitates some responses and inhibits others because we're focusing on that task. So irrelevant information and responses, anything that's not task relevant is ignored or inhibited. So we can set ourselves on the task at hand. Um, and that mental set is really important because it allows us to focus on what we're interested in. So if you sit down to write an essay for class, you get into the material, you get into thinking about it, you're not paying attention to anything else, and then your phone rings. And now you, or you get a text message from your significant other. And so now your mental set gets shifted. So you're now out of that mental set and back into something else. Um, the problem is that when we switch tasks, there's a switch cost. So in which performance declines following the switch. So you answer the phone or you answer the text message, and you go back to your essay and you find that it's more difficult to get back to where you were. This is why writers in particular, good writers and successful writers, will set aside time, place, and they kind of essentially lock themselves away from distraction because they need to be able to get into that place, focus, write, do that, and then come back out of that writing space. And that's what you need to do for your courses, is you need to get shut off all distraction, close Facebook, put your phone on silent, put it in the other room, 
and focus solely on what you're doing. And that's a really important thing to do. Now, a lot of people, if their phone's not nearby, get into this anxiety place. Well, you need to practice that. <laughs> practice not paying so much attention to your phone. It's an important thing to do. Um, and you'll find that after a couple of minutes of focusing on um, writing, that you won't even notice that you don't have your phone nearby or that you're not paying attention to it. Uh, and that's important. And then take a break. It's perfectly okay to take a break because you'll get to the point where you'll, you'll feel yourself get to that point um, where you're getting diminishing returns. So take a break and come back. Uh, or you'll get to a point where you've finished your thought um, and you need to move on to a different point or a different part of the essay and you can switch that. So some important issues with divided attention. Um, we are notorious particularly in the United States, for doing everything else but driving while we're driving. Um, we're putting on makeup, we're talking on the phone, we're trying to drink our coffee, all of these things while we're trying to drive. Uh, and living in Washington, D.C., I've seen it all. I've seen people with the newspaper open on their steering wheel. I've seen them with a novel open on their steering wheel. Um, and the way I know that... Um, driving and attention are intimately related is, as you can see from this mean, as soon as we feel like we're lost or traffic gets heavy or anything else unusual happens, it's snowing, uh, all of that, the first thing you do is turn down your radio uh, because you need to focus your attention on the task at hand. So that's how we know, one of the ways in which we know just from basic common sense, that driving does require a great deal of attention. And so we want to talk about um, cell phone use, uh, and we'll do that next. And we'll talk about distracted walking, and then finally mind wandering. So the data are really unequivocal here. Using a cell phone while driving diminishes performance. It doesn't matter if you're using your hands-free kit, if you're te texting or you're using Siri or some other voice-to-text feature, uh, that all requires attentional resources. So even using a hands-free device, participants miss about half the visual details as they do when they're not using a telephone, um, their cell phones. So we really have to be mindful of this particular problem, um, that cell phone use, no matter how you're using it, is particularly dangerous. And it's really dangerous when we're talking about things like texting, anything, looking at Facebook, anything when you're looking down from the road. Um, so if you look over here on the right, we have, um, in the light blue, single task performance versus dual task performance. And you can see when people are on their cell phone while driving, they miss uh, quite a bit more than they do when they're just focusing on driving. And their reaction times also go up. So it's a particularly dangerous thing to do. And in fact, in 2015, um, over 3,000 people lost their lives because of distracted driving. So you don't want to die and you certainly don't want to kill somebody because you are answering a text message. It can wait. Um, similarly, you got to be careful when you're walking. Engaging in a second task while walking results in significantly slower motor performance and reaction time. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind, that uh, as you're looking down at your phone, you slow down, people are going to run into you, um, I have to go around people who are doing this all the time when I'm trying to get places. There's a really clever study um, on a, it's called the <laughs> Do People Notice a Clown Riding a Unicycle um, by Hyman et al. And I highly recommend you take a look at it. Um, there's some really great videos of this as well. Uh, and they sh show that people looking down at their phones fail to notice even a clown riding a uh, unicycle past them. And so they go out into a part of their campus uh, called Red Square. We have a similar area on uh, the Georgetown campus and they watch people on their cell phones and what's interesting is they timed them going across and they took longer, no surprise there, and also many, many, many of them did not notice a clown running a unicycle right in front of them. Current estimates uh, are that at about 10% of auto pedestrian accidents are due to distracted walking and you certainly don't want to be like these people. So Let me get this switched on. And we'll uh, do that. Oop, here we go.
Now, there's some sound that goes with this, but you don't need to hear it. You can see it's pretty dangerous to, oops, oh, this one's really bad. Walking along and, oh, nope, I didn't realize there were stairs there. Fortunately, it doesn't look to be injured. I don't know who rollerblades and looks at their cell phone. That's really dumb. You can see it's pretty easy to injure yourself simply because you're not paying attention. And I think this is a really important lesson uh, for all of us because we can just get down, oh dear, um, into our own world and not paying any attention. Well, we all know how this one's going to turn out. Oh. You can see these, some of these people are really injured. Like he really janked his shoulder there. So uh, at the end of the day, you really want to watch out for this. You can, by the way, get on YouTube and spend quite a bit of time looking at videos of people walking into things, walking into fountains, walking into doors, poles, pools, all sorts of things. Um, so that's uh, just a quick lesson in that. Um, let me shut off that main screen. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about then is mind wandering. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's uh, related to sustained attention. So that is our ability to maintain uh, our attention over time is a, essentially a vigilance task. But as our minds wander, that mind wandering actually can become a new dual task. And essentially, now we're dividing our attention between um, vacationing in Bermuda and trying to drive down the street. And this can result in some pretty serious consequences. Um, so certainly driving, um, and I know I have had this experience, and I know numerous people who have had this experience, of driving long distance, and suddenly you realize you have no memory for the last 25, 35, 45 minutes of driving. Because your mind has wandered, um, and you haven't been paying very close attention to what's happening. And that has potentially serious consequences, of course. Um, certainly train operators, uh, this is a huge problem with. In, here in Washington, D.C., uh, they have a problem with metro train operators running lights. And they actually hired cognitive psychologists to come in and said um, they're just not paying attention. They're not able to sustain their attention over time. Uh, and as a result, they're missing uh, those because their minds are wandering. Um, and so what we see is that thinking about something else is in many ways as difficult as doing something else because your cognitive resources are still caught up in thinking about something else. So it's something to keep in mind. So a um, little summary of uh, attention. You can take a look at these um, at your leisure. They're in the PowerPoints uh, posted to the Canvas course for those of you who are in my cognition class. Uh, for those of you on YouTube, you can just pause this. Um, some good review questions as well um, from some other textbooks. And then finally, um, a um, bit of a list of key terms and concepts for all of our attention lectures. This probably isn't all of them, um, but certainly a pretty solid list for those of you, again, in my cognition course. Our final uh, lecture in this particular series on attention will be uh, the neuropsychology of attention. And that's coming up next.